rough waters. <laughs> Furthermore, the importance of being careful and precise when the collective we is imagined and used in ways that include and exclude is especially kindly in Guam in light of the recent court findings that rely on an inclusive we based on an uneven history of civil rights in the United States as a result of racism but also racialist thinking. I won't have time to elaborate on that, but the idea of civil rights in the United States, as important as that has been for the protection of rights of aggrieved minorities in the United States, has also been nothing less than devastating for indigenous peoples. Civil rights is a kind of inclusive we that has a very particular history in the United States. And especially as the recent ruling misguidedly, that's my, my opinion, misguidedly applies that external standard in ways that prevent a more inclusive notion of we based on indigenous notions of Chamorro collective identity. Hita, what does Hita mean? Exclusive we? Inclusive we? We decide, I'm not a Chamorro or a Chamorro expert. But I can tell you this, as a non-Chamorro growing up here, I can assure you I feel that my well-being as an individual is better protected by Chamorro ideas about a collective sense of belonging than, than, than I feel protected as a U.S. citizen under the protection of civil rights. I have more faith in indigenous ideas about who we are and how those people decide who belongs and who doesn't, especially what is right for their future in their cultural terms, than I have with my civil rights being protected under the Constitution of the United States. I know that's a radical idea, but that's how I feel. One of the things that happened here was one people's group of an inclusive we that actually has a very uneven history of inclusion and exclusion gets to stand as the standard for assessing an indigenous process for determining what that political future is going to look like from a vantage point of the people who understand themselves to be that people of the place. For this kind of for many reasons of triviality and the Guam Museum's heat this lecture series on identity with a critical view of distance to Guam. I can walk through this really quickly now. So so wrong and so right. This this is um, a costume that well, Disney released even before the film came out, the Maui suit. I don't know anybody, certainly no Islander, including those who love Moana, who thought that this was a good idea. Even as lovers said, how could Disney get it so right and yet get it so wrong with the Moana outfit. I'm gonna skip an analysis of what's wrong with it. If you're interested in it, I can send you an article that I wrote about it. But to answer that question, how could Disney get it so right? And yet get the Maui soup so wrong? Well, for those of us in Mana Moana, simple. Disney got the Maui suit so wrong because it got the Pacific so wrong. Actually, I think the Maui suit is perfectly appropriate for what Disney is trying to do. Co-opt 
wear the skin of Pacific Island peoples. I know people who love Moana, but hated it on opening night when they saw all these non-Pacific Islanders coming in dressed in brown skin. Oh, here we come. Plastic lay, and wearing the tattoos. This brings us to the question. So what's so wrong about a beautiful and moving tale of a so strong Pacific Islander girl who wants to learn to become a navigator while saving her island from evil forces? I actually want to say, we need that. I got two daughters. I want them to be like that. Right? I want Eva to save us from Disney. <laughs> so what's wrong about a beautiful and moving story? The strong Pacific Islander girl who wants to learn to become a navigator while saving her island from evil forces. Well, just for one thing, beautiful, moving tale, all this. How many people saw the film already? It's beautiful, right? It's, it's actually stunning beauty. And the sonics are amazing. The Tavaka, the group from Fiji, is um, up until this film, I love their music. And I still love hearing their sound. Um, well, one thing is wrong in general. In general, all that glitters is not gold. Just for starters. But we can be more specific. What's wrong? Only these. <laughs> Not too deep. Below the surface are ideas, firmly entrenched ideas about white supremacy. There's whitewashing colonialism through brown facing. That was the, the Maui suit. There's a false sense of cultural authenticity and the mystification of native identity and culture. You know, one of the things that really pissed me off about this film, I'm getting started, <laughs> is for a film that celebrates seafaring. Every single moment where there was an opportunity for her to really show some kind of navigation, it was a mysterious force of the ocean that helped her. Micronesia is known, unlike Polynesia. Anthropologists have told us this. For seafaring use of the stars, highly pragmatic, instrumental. Micronesians do not have the same level of spiritual, big deification of the stars. Maui and, you know, all those things. That star is where that island is. It's not the big mythological, religious kinds of things. It's actually really instrumental and practical. It's not to say there aren't religious and spiritual ideas about the ocean or the stars. That's not what I'm saying. What else? Colonial primitivism, colonial nostalgia. Noble savagery, I'm going to give definition to that in a while. Cultural homogenation, the mashup problem. American Indians hate this thing where Sioux culture, the Dakota, are habitually the image for all Native Americans. Kind of Polynesia operates like that for the Pacific. Unsustainable and cultural and environmental practices. Whoa, this film also has gone so far as to say talk about sustainability and caring for the ocean by selling plastics? <laughs> the number one killer of the ocean, plastics. When we take a look at Disney's mode of operation, we'll see two things. It realized very early on that its films are long-term, long-form commercials. And they're not just commercials, but they're commercials that operate specifically to children at the level of affect and desire, emotions. In many countries around the world, targeting advertising, targeted advertising to kids is illegal. This is the mode of operation for this country, for this company. 
mansplaining. Disney had a forum on gender and women's power. And every one of the panelists in that forum were white guys. It was also white guys who wrote the story about this strong iron girl. Give me a little bit of time and I can connect that to not just voyeurism, but looking at our girls like that. We're telling stories about them, about their power. Unethical manipulation of children's affects desires through stories that are in fact long form and extended commercials. These are even just generic stuff actually. What's wrong with that story? There's this. When specific aspects of specific communities and specific parts of the Pacific get to serve as the standard for what a real authentic Pacific Islander looks and sounds like. And this, denial and erasure of Micronesian Carolinian seafaring history, culture, traditional technological development. Especially this. When all those bad things lead to the perpetuation of generic and problematic ideas about authentic Pacific Islander culture and identity, such as to produce a standard for how Islanders are supposed to look and sound like in order to be real, as this lousy deal is predicated on the historical denial and erasure of seafaring history, culture, tradition, technological development in our part of the Pacific. When, ironically, our part of the Pacific played an essential role in helping other parts of the Pacific, it's chosen to stand as the standard for the entire Pacific. You see why I have to write it out? <laughs> What can possibly be wrong about a beautiful and moving tale of a strong Pacific Islander who learns to become a navigator while saving others? Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through every single one of this. Um, go to the Moana website or email me. I can send you the links. This is each one of those problems with uh, other links for more readings or elaboration. So, um, white supremacy through nostalgia, race and early representations of Native peoples and African Americans. Zippity doo da, zippity. Yeah. <laughs> this longing for Jim Crow South, depicting it as a happy moment. Here's whitewashing through brown facing. This article helped me understand a lot of things. Because Disney actually has a history of racist and sexist representations of people of color, especially natives, early on, when it started to get criticism, Disney, rather than stopping it, rather than desisting in going back and looking for material to tell the story, right, it shifted gears and it started to Henceforth, try to tell the stories authentically and correctly. Many anthropologists in, in the room will know that, well, all of us know that the question, questions around cultural authenticity are a double-edged sword. Right? But uh, Richard Rowe uh, has this wonderful article in the Journal of African American Studies that talks about, that actually chronicles how Disney shifted gears and proceeded to continue to tell the stories, but in ways that had the effect of whitewashing over the actualities of the histories of those groups of people. Moana, I believe, represents the culmination of about 25 to 30 years of this kind of work. sharpening the tools for how to tell that story more effectively through cultural authenticity. How many people saw Frozen? So Frozen, another lovable story, right, uh, also implicates Samiland. Samiland are the indigenous people, Greenland, 
right, of, of the sort of Arctic regions. They're the reindeer people, right? They're pissed off. Rwanda hadn't even been released. Disney sent a new team back to Samiland <coughs> to do a sequel of Frozen, but with indigenous culture. And what we heard from our colleagues in Samiland, activists, scholars, artists, was that there's mixed emotions in Samiland. There's a lot of people who are saying, get out of here. Quit mining our cultural resources. Leave it alone. There's others who say, well, what an opportunity. It's complex. Tavita Kaili is a Tongan anthropologist. He's especially, he's especially uh, knowledgeable about Maui and Tongan traditions. For him, he traces his genealogical descent to Maui the historical person. <coughs> so you can imagine someone, one of your genealogical ancestors being depicted as a buffoon. <laughs> Colonial primitivism, no, we'll have I'll come back to that. I think I've said enough about a lot of these. There, in each one of these, there's more resources. There's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful interview with Tina Nata, who's a Maori activist and teacher. And she has this interview with Sonali uh, Natakar from Rising Up about um, how Disney's actually environmentally unsustainable. Wonderful, wonderful um, interview. It was actually Tina's work. I don't. I never met her before, and I started reading her work. She does stuff on food sovereignty. She does stuff on environmental activism, um, uh, and uh, I really wanted to stay out of the Mo Moana free, honestly. You know, <laughs> it's a Polynesian thing. But it was actually her work that that, that hooked me. Right? She has this amazing blog called the non-plastic Maori. And by that, she doesn't mean purity non-plastic, non-modern non technological. No, she's actually not saying that. But she has a particular problem with plastic. And I think we should have a problem with plastic. Uh, uh, can I get into this? Uh, Disney CEO who makes like $50,000 an hour um, is a member of Trump's uh, Strategic Advisory Policy Council. Maybe that's enough said on that. <laughs> Mansplaining, I already talked about that. But there's a wonderful interview that Kelly Kaala, Kaala Kelly, a uh, Hawaiian uh, filmmaker, some of you might remember her film, Nolo Heva about militarization and environmental degradation in Hawaii. Uh, she has an interview with Tina. Uh, Keala and Tina are part of our collective. We all know Teresia Teagua was one of the earlier ones. She's also part of our collective. And uh, Terry uh, wrote this really wonderful first-hand account of, you know, she took this big sigh. Oh, Disney, I love Disney. I grew up with Disney. Right? Disney seduced me when I was a kid, and no more. This was a whole story about how Disney operates at the level of affect. I want to return to this really quickly, because I think that these are some of those deeply entrenched, uh, deep, deep-seated, long-standing, problematic ideas about the Pacific that is in firm control of the narrative. And if you don't understand how this operates, you could miss them. Colonial primitivism, noble savagery, and colonial nostalgia. Colonial primitivi prim primitivism is this idea about a demand and a desire for purity, for closer to nature way of living, 
more related to moments of cultural crisis within the West in relation to the perceived ills of modernity. Now, I know most of us in this room have problems with modern life. From environmental degradation to alienation to bad values and all of that kind of stuff. But primitivism is a very particular kind. It comes largely out of the West dealing with its own anxieties about modern modernity. And primitivism is this moment where those who are having problems with their ideas about the primitive long, I mean, with modernity, long for the places that have been untouched by modernity. These are the places of purity. And well, you know, the problem with that is that it becomes very easy to confuse those desires and anxieties with the actualities of the Pacific. The second problem with that is how that demands and desires translate very easily to ownership. Noble savagery is the particular valorization or romanticization of the idea of the superiority of quote, man in its natural state. Supposedly an improvement over seeing natives as plain old savages. No. Because a lot of the West looks at natives as savages, valorizing them as noble savages isn't any better. That's worse. But because it looks positive, people think it's good. Colonial nostalgia. This one is around us all, all over the place. And sometimes islanders have their own versions of primitivism. Noble savagery and nostalgia. Closely related to the, col the colonial primitivism is a specific longing for a time in the pre contact past, prior to colonization, when modernization and colonialism tragically messed everything up. <coughs> Such a history preempts saving the West from its sins, so it must purge or whitewash the realities of that colonial past read as contamination, in order to have the ability to imagine and then redeem itself with the notion of purity. That past is typically filled with mystical powers. That's why this story has to be set in a pre-colonial past. Why can't Disney do a story of 21st century Pacific Islanders and tell a powerful story like that? Because primitivism Noble savagery and colonial nostalgia preempt that kind. Of because the 21st century or modernity represents in that kind of thinking a corruption, an inauthentic islander. So like the only way we get to be authentic islanders is to wear the grass skirts from a very specific part of Polynesia. Leads to probably the most difficult part. How long have time? Four more minutes. <laughs> you could read this on your own. <laughs> uh, this is the part, this is that form of colonialism where I think it's the most insidious part. This is the form of colonialism that is not coercive. It doesn't hold a gun against you. It's the form of colonial rule where the colonized are active participants. And can articulate good reasons for that. But when we take a step back and look at the long haul, maybe you got a really good commission out of it. Maybe this is opening your doors for your, your career in entertainment. Whatever, whatever goods we can name in Islanders participating in something from the outside. And I'm not saying you can't do that. But I am saying we've got to be better about understanding our complicity when we have good reasons for participating in things. 
I'm disappointed at the Pacific Islanders who worked with Moana. They had a very narrow idea about ensuring cultural <coughs> authenticity. And I'm happy that they're happy that they hear their music and sounds and likenesses of their culture there. But like, what about the rest of us who get stuck? And don't mistake what I'm saying as envy. I was actually approached by agents of Disney to participate as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as an expert advisor for seafaring. <clears throat> no way. For me, seafaring represents a promise of liberation. I hand it to Disney. My view? Leave it alone, man. Just leave it alone. We don't have like a lot of stuff that, you know what I mean? opportunity to showcase, for instance, during Festback, I, I saw a lot of grass skirts and the very um, images that you talked about. Yeah, sure. But you know, I, I, I leave it to them to decide how they're going to represent themselves. But right? if you want to be authentic, why resort to that? This goes back to the question of, 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 of self-determination and sovereignty. The people should have the power to represent themselves in the way that they decide, right? Um, I actually, again, didn't, when I especially when I found out that a lot of um, formidable, formidable people were involved with, uh, with Moana, I and I still don't want to say you're wrong about authenticity. That's not what I'm saying here. But we have to tease out the differences between different discourses about cultural authenticity, you know? Uh, and, and I think it isn't just, I am not simply saying cultural authenticity is a problem. We have to be finer, I think. We have to be, we have to be, we, have, we need tools to understand. Differences between when Disney talks about cultural <coughs> authenticity. One of the things we can be sure here is that the story that was written was written by guys from Disney. And we know also from the, the people from who participated in Disney from the Pacific that they could only go so far. And at certain points, there's a lot of things they didn't like that still made it. Right? Then the other term that you said, showcasing, one of the best uh, comments I heard was, what's the name of the, the animation that came out of here? My, mice? Mice. Mice. This woman, uh, Tuti Baker, a uh, uh, Hawaiian filmmaker, working on her PhD in political science, uh, knows what she's talking about. She has a master's and uh, an, an MFA in, in filmmaking. And she said, I've seen uh, Misa, and I've seen Moana, and Misa, hands down, is superior. And she said that because, because Misa is very specific. We don't need any more of this mashup, generic, authentic Pacific composite. 